Okay, hi there, welcome to another video where we're going to take a look at how to put together a 25 mark ASAR answer to this question with a reference to examples of specific developing countries. Evaluate the potential benefits of developing countries borrowing issuing debt to accelerate their economic growth and development. The context here is that global debt levels around the world are actually at a record high. If you include public and private debt, this question is really about public or government debt. But as you can see here, in terms of developing countries and developed countries, the level of debt is now at a record high, uh, including a significant rise in low-income developing country debt just in the last few years. A period of very low interest rates has seen the level of debt as a share of world GDP now rise well above 200% of global output. In Africa, I suppose many countries, many students will be thinking about sub-Saharan African countries. In Africa, they've got about 5% share of world GDP, but the, the, the continent as a whole is under-financed, if like under-capitalised. They only have 1% of global stock markets, for example, 1% of global bond markets, which is quite interesting. Emerging markets have about a quarter of global bond issues, about a third of global stocks, but Africa is, is well behind. However, some African countries, uh, here are some good examples, Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Angola, they have been issuing euro bonds. They've gone into the international bond market and started issuing bonds. Uh, they currently pay an average yield of about 6, 6.5%. Six and, and the other bit of context I just wanted to show you in the, in the context of the question is the level of external debt. So oftentimes developing countries are borrowing money from external sources and they build up a level of external debt and that can be a significant burden to them. Uh, this table shows the level of debt service, the cost of meeting, paying the interest, if you like, on the, on the money borrowed. And in some countries such as Lebanon, Venezuela, Mongolia, uh, the level of interest payments accounts for nearly half of the value of their exports. That can be a, a major burden and relevant to the question. So here we go. Let's think about how we shape a really good A-star 25 mark answer. In many developing countries, such as Kenya and Zambia, tax revenues are low, below 15% of GDP. And this means that there are basic, big financing shortfalls to meet the basic public spending needs. And as a result, a government, such as the Kenyan government, might decide to borrow money through the issue of bonds. Let the examiner know you're aware of how this, this works. To finance investment projects. This is done via, called, this is called debt financing and can be achieved via domestic and or overseas creditors. Now then build the chain of analysis. So borrowing might be to, to fund, to finance essential capital investment in infrastructure, such as better housing, improved transport, links, new hospitals and sanitation. The latter is usually seen, of course, as being a public good. So there's a case for the government to borrow money long term to invest in infrastructure. Borrowing to invest means that over time the, the capital stock goes gets bigger, thus leading to an increase in productivity, long run aggregate supply and hopefully improved competitiveness. So you're making the link between uh, developing countries borrowing to, to uh, improve their economic performance. Providing that borrowing is sustainable, it can be an important tool for faster GDP growth linking back to the question, and absolute poverty eradication, which ultimately will lift per capita incomes and increase tax revenues. So therefore, providing productive state investment funded by borrowing raises a country's potential output, and therefore their ability to repay loans in the future. In this way, the potential benefits are large. So in a nutshell, borrow to invest, to lift a country's productive capacity, to lift incomes and generate tax revenues in the future. Obviously, they need to evaluate, leave a couple of lines and build your evaluation point. Well, here's my argument. Often the positive effects of debt financed investment are reduced because of corruption and the incomplete, incomplete use of rigorous objective cost benefit analysis before a dollar of a project is, is underway. Corruption and lack of cost-benefit analysis are both examples of government failure. The classic Mozambique Tudor bond is mentioned as my contextual example. 
They borrowed nearly a billion US dollars for their national fishing industry, but instead spent the money allegedly on military boats and equipment. Well, the result of corruption and uh, lack of cost-benefit analysis is that a developing country is left with an increasing level of debt, which then adds to the cost of servicing the loans. Kenya has a level of government debt above 50% of GDP. Uh, the government debt of the lowest income countries, the LIC, has reached 55% of GDP in 2019. And some economists argue that the increased <coughs> government debt and borrowing can then crowd out the private sector, either because um, they cause market interest rates to go up or because ultimately the government has to increase tax rates, which then hampers investment. So corruption and government failure can limit the benefits of investment and borrowing and that ultimately the high borrowing squeezes interest rates up. And of course, you, you could then use a crowding out diagram showing government borrowing potentially causing higher interest rates, particularly if savings are scarce in low and middle income countries. Good example, contextual example, the IMF uh, saying that they're worried about the level of debt in Africa. 40% of sub-Saharan African countries uh, at distressed debt levels. That's when it becomes much harder to repay the interest on the debt. So the African government debt will increase in the next three years above 70% of GDP. And uh, you know, for, for developing countries, that is uh, emerging countries, that's a pretty high level of debt, although less than in some advanced nations. Okay, my second KAA point. Don't forget, in a 25 marker, you're looking to develop two major KAA points, two major evaluation points, and then a final reasoned comment. Second justification for borrowing is to enhance growth. Uh, sorry, it, to enhance growth is that it makes sense to invest in the nation's human capital and natural capital, specifically to overcome multiple market failures, the state addressing market failure issues. So, for example, increased state funding of primary and secondary education designed to lift enrollment ratios and increase the mean years of schooling can have a significant impact on productivity in the long term. <clears throat> Borrowing can help an emerging country to diversify their economy, to reduce primary product dependency. For example, a government might borrow to fund renewable energy projects, such as solar power. The increased capacity from those investments will help reduce energy dependency, contribute to mitigate against climate change risks, and also make reliable power cheaper for firms. If the private sector is unable or unwilling to provide the funding for public and merit goods, then my argument is the state has a key role to play in borrowing to finance them directly or through initiating public-private partnerships. Without state borrowing and given the low tax-to-GDP ratios, growth will be held back. Sustained progress in improving HDI schools would come under threat. So in a nutshell, I'm arguing here that it makes sense for the government to borrow to overcome market failure, particularly in education, particularly in environment. If the government doesn't borrow, then they're going to undermine their long-term growth potential and limit HDI scores. Valuation, of course. Counter-argument is that borrowing carries risks, including the fear that high rates of lending now could lead to an external debt crisis in the future. So, for example, 2018, sub-Saharan countries borrowed $17 billion in euro bonds. However, as I said before, this debt is relatively expensive. The yield, 6.5%, 7%. When debt stocks are high and then interest rates go up, the cost of servicing this borrowing can climb sharply. In Kenya, for example, external debt is now over a third of their gross national income and interest payments account for nearly a quarter of their exports. So one big risk if the government borrows money is that a, perhaps a fall in a major commodity price that they export, a primary commodity that they're a major export of, goes down and the depreciation of the exchange rate happens. Well, that increases the real value of debt expressed in a foreign currency, leaving a government with less to spend on public services and welfare, which in turn can damage their growth prospects. In short... Uh, if you borrow money, uh, more expensive debt means that governments have to spend more of their revenues repaying it, and there's an opportunity cost. Then you're looking for a final 
reason comment. It doesn't have to be necessarily very long, but it has to reflect the question and think a little bit more about the wider picture. So here's my attempt at an A-star final reason comment. Uh, government borrowing, if used well, can make a, a key important contribution to sustainable development, particularly for countries exposed to the effects of climate change and with huge infrastructure needs. Keynesians point to the impact that such a fiscal stimulus can have on aggregate demand as well as supply. That said, many low- and middle-income countries are vulnerable to growth changes in the growth of world trade, fluctuating currencies and capital market interest rates. Uh, instead of increasing the national debt, they might be better off by introducing structural economic reforms designed to improve governments, reduce corruption and stimulate the private sector to attract a bigger, stronger inflow of foreign direct investment and perhaps equity flows into their stock markets. In this way, if you can stimulate the private sector, uh, the burden on future taxpayers can be kept under control. So the thinking here is that actually in the long term you need economic reforms to attract private capital, which just takes some of the pressure off the need for the state to, to borrow money. OK, there we go. There was my A-star answer to a question about the potential benefits of government borrowing amongst developing countries.